Rusty Kamori, and this is Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. I was the head coach of the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we were fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. This show is based on my books, Beyond the Lines and Beyond the Game, and many people find it inspiring and motivating and helps you keep the right mindset in dealing with life's challenges. My special guest today has over 150 TV and film credits to her name, and she is currently on the hit TV show Magnum PI. She is Amy Hill, and today we are going beyond acting. Hi, Amy, welcome to the show. Hi, welcome, I know, thank you, welcome me to the show. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the show. Wait a minute, it's not my show. <laughs> <laughs> it can be your show, Amy. <laughs> now, Amy, I, I know that you uh, were born in South Dakota. Tell me about your background growing up. Well, I was born in Deadwood, South Dakota, which uh, until that show was on HBO, nobody believed existed. Uh, and there were really very few people in town. There was one hospital, one stoplight uh, and I was on a farm that wasn't a working farm even. My dad worked in a, a gold mine in Leed, South Dakota. And uh, it was a Finnish farming community. So there were some farms somewhere. And uh, yeah, it was quite lonely. I didn't have anybody to play with. My brother was older than me and he had wanted to do nothing with me. And um, so I had animals and horses and open plain. It was beautiful, but uh, so all I had was my imagination. And that's something I used a lot. I watched TV, um, did a lot of playing in my imagination, creating characters, storylines, imagined I was other people. <laughs> and my mother was concerned for my mental health. Uh, and then we moved to Seattle when I was six. And uh, that's where I was raised, in Seattle. And it was good because I, there were other people around. And, uh, you know, I mean, we were kind of, a, there weren't people who were multiracial, though. So that was another thing to deal with growing up in Seattle. Well, Amy, your mom is Japanese and your yes. dad is Finnish. And Correct. What's the most important thing you learned from your parents? Well, I think, you know, my dad was, he had a really good, they both had really good work ethics, which is something that I think I learned early was that the harder you, you know, if you work hard, you're rewarded. So my dad worked very hard. He uh, was a good person, really a good person so honest and just a delightful man. But, uh, you know, he was sort of hindered, I think in some ways by the way he grew up in, in Deadwood. So he didn't have big ambitions. He just had ambitions to make a living. <laughs> <laughs> Where my mother, in some fashion, because she was Japanese, she always expected us to do better than she ever did, do better than my dad and her had done in life. So, you know, there was always this specter of failure with her. So I worked really hard, I think, to do well because I didn't want to fail my mother. Where my father, if I just, you know, survived, it would be okay. But with my mother, who's Japanese, it was like, no, no. So whatever accomplishments I made, uh, growing up, she would always be like, well, that's fine, but what about, you know, this? So when I first got a television show, she said, when are you going to Broadway? You know, I mean, it was always, there was one more thing I had to do to win her, uh, you know, respect. Now, Amy, how did you get interested in acting? How did it all start? Well, it started in Deadwood. I mean, I didn't know I was acting. I just was creating characters and you know, writing scripts in my head. So uh, that's where it started, I think. And that was always the safe place to go. 
even in Seattle, because I didn't, you know, I wasn't really fully accepted by the community of kids because I was Papa. That wasn't even a word when I was six, but uh, you know, I wasn't like the other kids. So I, you know, did that same thing. I created characters. I performed for the Italians across the street and they literally sat in their picture window watching me on the front porch performing. Like I was a television show that was there for their entertainment. And I thought of them as my audience as well. So it was really, you know, something that just came naturally to me, but I never felt safe telling anybody that I wanted to be an actor because I never saw, well, rarely saw anybody that looked like me on television until Nancy Kwan, then everything changed. But uh, by high school, I felt safe enough to be able to take some drama classes, get into theater and, you know, within a very short period of time, I was in every play on stage. And then I started doing community theater in Seattle and it was just, I, you couldn't stop me. And then I moved to, after graduating from high school, I moved to Tokyo to go to university. And in Tokyo, I started doing, um, you know, radio and television and other things. It was great. Well, I like hearing all of that. And, and Amy, how, so how did your uh, role come about on Magnum PI? Well, it's interesting because my daughter and I would visit Hawaii at least twice a year. It was our, one of our favorite places to come visit because we have a lot of friends here and it just felt comfortable. And it was like immediately you get off the plane and your all your worries and cares disappear. It's just lovely. So my daughter, her first choice university was University of Hawaii and she got in. And uh, after she got in, we were making our plans to, you know, settle her in, fly here, get her into the dorms. And about two weeks before that, I got a call from my agent saying that Peter Lenkoff wanted to have a meeting with me. And I said, oh, I didn't even know Magnum PI was gonna be shooting. I didn't know anything about Magnum PI. I never even saw the first one. Anyway, so I had a meeting with him and he said, yeah, we're doing this show, Magnum PI, the reboot. And uh, we're gonna have this character who is the cultural curator of the show and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, we talked for like 20 minutes. And then he said, are you interested in doing it? And I said, when do you need me? And he says, next week. <laughs> so it was very short notice. Uh, and I said, yes. It was easy. Oh, that was, yeah. that's perfect. I, I'm glad it worked out like that. And Amy, you know, I, I was fortunate to, to go to uh, many, many Sunset on the Beach premieres. And, you know, I want to know how you enjoyed yourself at Sunset on the Beach. Well, this is a phenomenon that's specific to Hawaii and to Hawaii Five-O and Magnum PI. It's something that I've never experienced. I've been on other series. I've been to other premieres. There's nothing like this because they have events beforehand where fans from around the world will come and you have like, there was a pancake breakfast that you had at Wine, what's Wailana Cafe with uh, some of your fans. And then people are on the beach from all over the world screaming and yelling. It's just, it's like the Oscars or something. It's bizarre and wonderful at the same time. So it's good. You get to meet your fans. And the first sunset, nobody knew us because no, we hadn't even premiered the show yet. <laughs> so they're like, oh, hi, <laughs> who are you? But the second year was really fun because they had seen the show and they knew all of our characters. Now, Amy, how are you guys adapting to the COVID-19 situation on set now? Well, the reason we started in September is that's when I think everybody had figured out what the set protocols would be to make it make sure that it was safe. Because I think, um, you know, actors were just as concerned as uh, anybody else that they'd be in a safe environment. Nobody wants to go to work and get sick and die. <laughs> so uh, we 
were sure that everything had been set in terms of safety. And, um, and it's great. It feels like we're in a, it, we're in the safest place on the island being on that set. We get tested constantly. We have uh, somebody's, we have those hand sanitizers everywhere. We have masks, you know, we have so much and shields, face shields. We are so safe and nobody gets close to one another except for the actors, you know, we have to be close. But as soon as they yell cut, masks go back on, everybody, you know, make sure that we're sanitized and it's fantastic. Oh, that's great to hear. And Amy, you know, it seems like your co-actors, I mean, you guys all have such great chemistry on, you know, on TV. Uh, why is that? You know, I think that's one of the things that Peter Lenkoff did particularly well for our show at least, is cast people that were uh, grounded in a sense of reality of their own lives. They're not there, nobody is there to be a celebrity. They're all there to do a job. And Jay, of course, being the star of the show, he's the one who really sets, I think, the tone. And he is so wonderful to work with. He works the hardest because he's in everything. And you'd think he'd be a little, you know, snippy, but he's not, you know, he's exhausted. Uh, he naps a lot, you know, between takes and uh, setups, but uh, he's always got a good sense of humor. He's always um, quick to take care of other people. Um, he's really lovely to work with. And Purdy, Perdita, is all equally because she's British. British people are so easy to work with. <laughs> they have no ego. They're just so self-effacing and wonderful. And she's also super smart. Both of them are super smart. <laughs> they work really hard, great sense of humor, lovely people, and caring. They care about everyone equally. You know, crew, cast, everybody they love and care. And they are concerned with making it a family. Um, and the rest of the cast is the same. They're all just great people. And we enjoy each other's company. We hang out outside of the set. Uh, not right now as much. I mean, maybe they do, but I'm not doing anything. <laughs> I, still, I still just go home. Uh, so yeah, we're really lucky. No, I like I like that. And Amy, you know, uh, in terms of your character roles, how much input are you able to give to the writers and producers about how you want your character to be portrayed? Well, Kuma was um, sort of, well, it happens. Sometimes you have a lot of input and sometimes you don't know what they want from you. They don't know why they asked you to be in this thing. Well, they say, we want you. And you think, okay, what do I, and so you sort of create your own character. So in this case, he said, we want you to play this character. So I started creating something. And then when I got to the set, I remember <laughs> that he changed my name from some Japanese name to a Samoan name. And I was like, well, that's, you know, that's a different person. <laughs> so sometimes I feel like writers or creators aren't aware of the process of creating a character as an actor. So I had to make a quick uh, adjustment in terms of who I am. And now I'm sort of in that space where it's a collaboration, I guess. When I get a script, it informs me of who my character is more than normal. This is giving me more information. So like, you know, apparently my character has been in jail several times because I'm doing an episode where I say, you know, this is not my first time in bracelets. So I think, oh, I guess I've been in jail a lot. Uh, <laughs> so you find out things and it's kind of fun as an actor to sort of build this person as you go along. I mean, there's a center core of who I am. And in some shows, like when I did Unreal in Vancouver, this character had the same, nobody told me anything. So I had to sort of create my own reality and then it manifested itself in the script 
as I went along and I went, oh, I'm so good. <laughs> Amy, well, you know, I watched your uh, featured episode last season where, you know, you got kidnapped. You get kidnapped a lot. I do. You know, that was a really cool, intense episode. And, you know, how Kumu was showing empathy for, you know, kind of understanding why the kidnapper was kidnapping right. you. Um, how was it filming that episode? It was good. It was, you know, <laughs> it was good it was kind of funny to me too because i'd never really done a picture car before i mean you know the driving yeah so that was one of the hardest things is like acting and driving at the same time so because i was like driving because i had a big stuff was going on and i was and the <laughs> director kept saying you know you're moving the wheel an awful lot just keep <laughs> your hands on the wheel don't move and i was like oh because i'm like ah, ah. <laughs> And I realized that the car would have been like, act, would have gone off the road because I was driving so maniacally. And so those are the things that uh, are fun, fun as you go. But yeah. acting, it's the business and the acting sometimes that's, that's hard to uh, coordinate. Amy, I also remember watching you on a Seinfeld episode when you played uh, Frank Costanza's uh, long long uh love interest and yes. it was so cool to see you on that it was great oh my god that was a dream working with uh jerry stiller and you know what i think meeting him and working with him was better than anybody else on the show often i'm not that impressed with contemporaries you know like jerry and those, they're my age they're my contemporaries I think, oh, they're great, but I'm not like, oh. But people I used to watch when I was a kid, you know, in black and white on television in my living room, <laughs> it's like stunning when you meet them. You can't believe you're in the same space as they are. And he was so sweet and he loved rehearsing. He wanted to rehearse all day because he's older. So he'd say, you want to do another rehearsal? You want to rehearse? You want to rehearse? I'd be like, yes. <laughs> Because in between rehearsing, he'd tell stories, you know, about the old days. So great. Now, Amy, you know, in my books, um, Beyond the Lines and Beyond the Game, I talk a lot about achieving and sustaining success. And you're someone that definitely goes beyond the lines. I mean, your career is amazing. And people tend to define success in different ways. How do you define success? You know, um, early on in San Francisco, I remember writing a list of uh, goals and my goals were not around, you know, like financial success or celebrity. It was really around having the respect of my peers as an actor. And um, I feel like I've attained that. And also, uh, you know, being able to work. And I've attained that. And having an agent, I remember writing that, having an agent who understood who I was and I had a good relationship with. And, you know, it isn't about how much work they get from me or anything. It's just having somebody that I can have a conversation with who knows who I am as an actor, an artist, and I have that. Um, so it's really, for me, success is being able to do the work, having, and if I don't, if somebody doesn't hire me, I've learned now that I can also create my own work by doing the solo shows. So you're not, uh, you're not limited by anything. If you're a creative person, you can do it. And sometimes people want you to do it for them. <laughs> and, and it's great. So I've had a very successful career. And I think, though, now that I have a child who is now in college, really the most success I've achieved is, uh, I think, raising a, a daughter who I am proud of. That's fantastic. 
And, and Amy, I mean, I find it super incredible that, I mean, you have, like I said earlier, over 150 TV and film credits to your name. When you reflect back on your career, why, why are you successful? Well, my success is probably uh, based in what I learned, well, from my family, my mother, who was always uh, reinventing herself. I mean, she married a, the GI, the enemy, and moved to Deadwood, South Dakota with him uh, and had to sort of reinvent herself many times along the way and faced a lot of challenges in her own country in Japan. And then, you know, in her time here in the United States. But um, when I lived in San Francisco, I studied improv. And basically, the improv teacher I had, had, it's like an approach to life, saying yes to life. If you don't say yes, you'll never see what's on the other side of that door. Yes, and is creating, you know, your future. If you say no, that's at the end of your future. And you have to um, learn to look forward to that and not fear it, which is another lesson I learned moving forward because you don't know as an actor ever, if you're never gonna, you may never work again, ever. Every job ends and you think, okay, that's it. So you have to look forward to what the possibilities are. I mean, I never knew that I would be a series regular on anything. I never knew their voice jobs even existed. I didn't know half of the things that I've done would ever come my way, but I've always said yes. And so that's really important. And always the other thing in improv is be the best person you can be. Whether you're playing a character who's stupid, you're the smartest stupid person ever. You have to just, you're limited by the knowledge you have, but you never think you're stupid. You know what I mean? So uh, that's another thing. And listening, listening. If you listen, you don't have to act so hard. Then people, you're informed by what people tell you. So listening is also really important. So these are the things that are, keys. Yeah. And Amy, a lot of my uh, actor friends, they, they tell me that they've heard the, the word no so many times, you know, after going to auditions. Have you heard the word no? Oh, yes. Many, many times. But so I try to approach each audition as a performance in itself. So I go in and I perform and whether they say yes or no, it doesn't matter because I've, you know, I've uh, satisfied my own needs. Yeah, and I think that's a good perspective to have because it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's all about mindset. I'm always, you know, coaching my players about mm -hmm. you know, having the right mindset and looking forward to challenges and I want to know, Amy, what is a big obstacle that you uh, faced in your life that you had to overcome? Well, I think in many ways growing up, it's always been uh, not fitting into somebody's idea of who I should be. So, you know, growing up in Seattle, I was multiracial and, you know, I don't know how people perceive me, but it wasn't always kind. And then when I moved to uh, San Francisco, there was also, you know, some perceptions of why, you know, I always felt like there was a part of me that people couldn't accept. So, you know, you sort of think, well, there aren't real high expectations of me. So what the hell? I'll just do whatever I feel like doing. You know, I'm not in jail. Like my mother would say sometimes, oh, I don't know. And I'd say, mom, why are you complaining? I'm not in jail. <laughs> because I think in some ways, you know, the expectations of people who are multiracial weren't so good. Um, and then when I moved to Los Angeles, I go to auditions and, you know, directors would say, you don't look Japanese. Or they'd say, just, you know, nobody expect, I wasn't this, I didn't look like a, somebody who would work ever 
But I never perceived myself as somebody who wouldn't work. I knew that I would always have theater. I would always, you know, I just always just kept going. There you go. (laughs) It's the old adage, you know, many times, what do they say? The beginning is, who's Amy Hill? Get me Amy Hill. And then I guess, who's Amy Hill? (laughs) (laughs) Which I don't care. Amy, was there a turning point in your career that really vaulted you to the, that higher level of acting and success? Well, actually, you know, doing the solo show was the big turning point. I think personally, it was a huge turning point because I had taken the power to create in my own hands and it turned into a huge success and everybody came to see the show. They were all like all the networks. And it's really a lesson in, you know, you're the one who's going to be writing your own story. You're the one who's creating your own uh, opportunities. So, uh, and it wasn't intended that way. I just wanted to tell my story. I had a passion for this story and I just wanted to get it out. And it, became a huge success and it led to a lot of opportunities and the first uh series that i did all american girl came sort of out of that experience oh, and then wow. it was you know just one job after another it was great now amy if you could choose a co-star to work with uh in the future someone that you haven't worked with yet who would that actor be? Well, you know, I kind of like to work with Meryl Streep. <laughs> Great. I'd like to be, yeah, I'd like to hang out with her. Because I think I've met her. Uh, oh, I did a show at Lincoln Center and she came to see it with her daughter. And I think she just seems like a cool person. And she'd be somebody who would be fun to play with. Wow, that's, well, she's definitely legendary. We, we need her to watch yeah. this show so that we can make that yeah, happen. exactly. And, and Amy, I, I want to ask you one more question before okay. we Okay. What gives you fulfillment? I think my fulfillment comes with, uh, I think, making someone feel better about themselves in some fashion. So whether it's shows that I've done, performances I've done, things that have been out there. My solo show, when I toured the the country in Canada, it really affected people. It made them think about their own lives. It made them feel better about who they were or curious about who they're. So those are the things, I mean, I think there's a part of me that is uh, an activist of sorts. I wanna make a difference in the world. Performing is something I love to do and writing is something I love to do. So if I can do it and make somebody shift to the way they think, that's huge. Well, Amy, you definitely go beyond the lines, and I want to thank you for taking time in your schedule to join me on the show today. Thank you. And thank you for watching Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. For more information, please visit rustykomori.com, and my books are available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. I hope that Amy and I will inspire you to create your own superior culture of excellence and to find your greatness and help others find theirs. Aloha.